Welcome to the Tudor Dixon podcast. The country seems to be in total disarray under this current administration. This week, we're mourning the loss of three brave service members who were killed on Sunday in a drone attack in Jordan and dozens of additional servicemen and women who were injured. And this administration has not even been able to coherently communicate with the American people about the attack or what they plan to do next. At the same time, we had a record number of illegal immigrants cross the southern border in December. And debanking is getting a new level of exposure after the morons at SNL made an oopsie during a Saturday night script. I'm excited about chatting with with Congressman Jim Jordan about all of this and more. But first, I want to tell you about my friends at American Financing and how they've been helping your neighbors save money for 25 years. They've saved customers an average of $854 a month last year by tapping into their home's equity to pay off high interest debt. And with mortgage rates dropping into the fives, now is a great time to call American Financing. All it takes is a 10-minute call to 866-890-9313. They never charge any upfront fees. And that's why they have over 7,200 Google reviews and a 4.7 star rating. They've helped thousands of customers save real money and put themselves into a better financial position. So call today and see what they can do for you. It's 866-890-9313. That's 866-890-9313. AmericanFinancing.net, NMLS. 182334 NMLS APR for rates in fives start at 6.40% for well qualified borrowers. Call today. It's 866 890 9313 for details about credit costs and terms. And now I want to welcome in Congressman Jim Jordan to the podcast. He represents Ohio's 4th District and is the chairman of both the Judiciary Committee and the Weaponization of Federal Government Subcommittee. Welcome to the podcast. Good to be with you. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, You know, we're having, obviously, a very sad week in the United States with this drone attack that killed U.S. troops in Jordan. And we're watching the administration kind of fall all over themselves. I wanted to play something quickly with sure. the pr- press secretary from this week. Here it is. What I will say, our deepest, uh, obviously our deepest condolences uh, go out and our he- heartfelt condolences go out to the families uh, who lost uh, three, three brave uh, three brave, uh, three brave of uh, three folks who are, who are military folks who are brave, who are always fighting, who are fighting on behalf and of uh, this administration of the American people. Obviously, more so, more importantly, uh, we lost those souls. I, I think this is like the perfect example of this administration and their disorder. She she doesn't even know how to talk about this. When you see this, yeah. what do you think? Well, someone, some smart person once said that, uh, you know, weakness invites aggression. And I think you, you see mm. that with this administration. When you project weakness from the Oval Office, when you're the commander in chief and you are, you know, project the, the way Joe Biden does, bad people are going to do bad things, whether it's Hamas and Hezbollah attacking our, our dearest and best friend in the state of Israel, whether it's Russia coming into Ukraine, or whether it's what happened to these th- three brave service members uh, and, 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 and the other people who were injured. So this is, you know, I, I love the question, uh, Tudor, that, that, Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo got asked a year and a half ago when Russia first went in Ukraine. He's doing an interview and he gets asked a question. He go, they go, Mr. Secretary, would this have happened in a Trump administration? And Mike gave the best answer. He says, well, the short answer is I don't know. But I do know this. It didn't happen in a Trump administration. And that sort of says it all because he, President Trump projected strength as opposed to what we see with Joe Biden. So you, you see this t- I mean, I actually think the, the, the maybe the best metaphor, it's sad, but the best metaphor for this administration was that plane taking off of Af- out of Afghanistan with people trying to jump on the wheels of that plane. It mm-hmm. shows just how, how pathetic they've done, not just foreign policy, but domestic policy and everything else. Okay, so I need a clarification for from you on something, because I think a lot of us are reading social media and there's a lot of I would call them influencers out there. They're saying war, no war, do this, do that. Everybody has an opinion. But a lot of people were out there saying, you know what, if this were Trump, there would be no war, there would be nothing. And I think that that is 
people are mistakenly saying that he would not defend the United States. But but there was an attack on Iran, but but really a very targeted attack taking out General Soleimani. And that was that was to deescalate. What would what would you suggest in this situation? I I would suggest that that kind of activity, that 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 kind Mm -hmm. of action, I should say, uh, President Trump did that. President Trump also just conveyed when he talked to these people, you know, a great example. It's not necessarily in, in you know, the exact context, but take the border situation. I remember the president tells this story. He says he went to the president of Mexico and says, you're going to we need you to keep these folks the remain in Mexico policy. We need you to keep these folks in your country while we evaluate their asylum claims. And he says the, the, the president of Mexico said, no, we're not going to do that. And President Trump goes, no, we need you to do this. And the president of Mexico said, we're not going to do this. President Trump says, we're going to put tariffs on you unless you do this. And suddenly he had, you know, he had one of those moments. Well, oh, well, on second thought, I think we will do that, Mr. President. So that, that is the way President Trump got things done. And you just don't see that with, with President Biden. Um, and then the example you use with Soleimani, I think that sent a message and changed things. You know, it, it, that's the difference. I always remember um, remember the G20 when President Trump first goes to the G20 meeting. This is like 2017, 20, it was relatively early in his administration. And all those, you got all these heads of states on the stage and President Trump walks out and like says, sort of get out of my way, the United States is back. And, and it, it, that is, that's the difference. And bad guys see that. Um, that, that they, they see that strength that, that President Trump had. They do not see it, unfortunately, in our current commander in chief. Well, and when you ha- look at that attack on, on Soleimani, when you look at the, that taking out Soleimani, that was when Iran was much more vulnerable. They didn't have the kind of money that they have that was that they earned while Joe Biden took those sanctions off. You talk about Good that point. way as of a of negotiation. We don't have that in this administration. They have actually caused massive problems and disruptions on peace in the Middle East, but peace worldwide. How do you bring that back now that they've been able to earn all of this oil money and bring all of this in and create this powerful terrorist network? Well, ultimately, you bring it back by, uh, you know, this November when you elect President Trump back in the White that, that, That's that's why this election, like all elections, is important. But but this one, when you can see the sharp contrast between, uh, you know, President Biden and President Trump, that's why this election is so important, because you have to have someone who, who does. I love what, uh, I, I just thought this, but I love what, when Sarah Huckabee Sanders gave the response to the State of the Union, she, she, made, a, she, she made a great line. I mean, she did a great job, but, but which, by the way, is tough, because... You know, the State of the Union, you're in the chamber with all the lights and the cameras and the people. When you do the response, you're just talking to a camera. But in her, in her response, she said this. She said, the divide in America today is normal versus crazy. And that is so true. Everything the left wants to do, everything the Biden administration has done, just doesn't make good common sense. And so th- that's, that's what we have to have back in the White House, someone like President Trump, who, who will do what he said he did, who does the right things, who does things that are common sense and just make just, just good policy that's that's the distinction here. I mean, I've said for a long time, we see all these people that have come into the Biden administration and it's, you know, a lot of these young activists that are running social media. They put things out all the time that I mean, they dox our troops on social media. They put things out all the time that are dangerous. You've got people that are dressing as women and then stealing suitcases. I mean, this does not <laughs> seem like serious vetting of the people who have <laughs> access to important documents and information. You know, I mean, it's it, when I look at this well, administration, I'm like. <laughs> Did they really think about running the country or did they just want to have like a fashion magazine? Yeah. Well, that, I mean, think about the normal versus crazy. It is crazy to defund the police. That's what I mean. It is crazy to think boys should compete against girls in sports. It is crazy to not have a border. It is crazy to say non-citizens should be allowed to vote and actually allow that to happen in certain places. It, I mean, you could just keep going. to. It is crazy not to project strength from the Oval Office. It is crazy to give Iran a bunch to take off the sanctions, which enables them to get a bunch of money. It is. You can just keep it. Here's a good one. It's crazy, at least in my judgment. You're from Western Michigan. I'm from Western Ohio. We've got common sense, I think. But this administration, the Biden administration, led us Chinese spy balloon. Think about this. Mm -hmm. Fly clear across the country and then shot it down. I mean, I'm just a country boy from Ohio, but I think I'd have probably shot it down before it went across the country. I'm sure you would have done the same. I'm sure the good people who listen to your podcast would have done the same. And I know President Trump wouldn't have let it go clear across the country before he shot it down. So the, the, it, like you say, everything it seems from this administration is just goofy and crazy. And again, I think that's why in November the American people are going to say, we want President Trump back in the White House. 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, we here we're facing a pipeline shutdown. We've seen his own administration, the the staffers go out on his front lawn and protest his policies. It's it just seems completely out of control. I think that beyond crazy, it's just total disarray, total disorganization. Yep. Nobody knows what they're doing. I mean, I think that KJP getting out and saying that as crazy as that sounded, it's like that's exactly what this administration sounds like on a daily basis and she has to talk because he can't talk i mean it's yeah. it's become so bad to see him out there on the world stage but let's get to the border because you've, you've brought that up a couple of times you talked about what trump did with the border to secure it we have seen record numbers come across in december we know that we have a chinese influence in central america in in south america we know that a lot of people that are coming across the border are on the terror list i mean this is completely out of control joe biden was just asked about it and he's like you know blaming congress on a regular basis well if i had what i needed well, Trump did this. What does he right. not have? What can he not? Why is he in this situation where he thinks he's going to be able to flip this narrative on Republicans in this election? Because well, we have the situation because on January 20th, 2021, the first day of the administration, Joe Biden made three decisions. He said, we will no longer build the wall. We will no longer have remain in Mexico policy where people waited there while we evaluated their claims for asylum. And he said, we will once you get to the country, you will be released. So those three things just incentivize the entire world to come to our country. And you talked about some of the numbers, some of the people on the terrorist watch list that we've encountered, a bunch of people we probably haven't, unfortunately. So that's why we're on pace to reach 12 million. I tell people that's the equivalent. In Joe Biden's presidency, we were on, on pace to get to 12 million migrants coming in the country. That is equivalent to the entire population of Ohio. And we're the seventh largest state. We're like Michigan. We're a big state. That, that is unbelievable. I don't know that's ever happened. So. But the scary thing is, this is deliberate, this is intentional, this is a willful decision by the Biden administration to do this to the country. And now even independents and Democrats are saying, time out, this has got to stop. So this will be an issue front and center in this election. I think this, Tudor, I think this election is so basic. Think about it, in three years and what is it, 10 days now, three years and 10 days, we have went from a secure border to no border. We went from safe streets to record crime. We went from $2 gas to three, four, five dollar gas. And we went from stable prices to record inflation. We went from being, uh, you know, I think respected around the world where President Trump projected strength to Joe Biden projected weakness. And of course, the kicker is we've seen these federal agencies turned on the American people and actually been weaponized against we the people of this country. That's the election. That's what this is about. Which side do you believe in? I think the country believes in the, the side of, of President Trump, and I think that's why he's going to win in November. When people see this happening in their own towns where they're being replaced by people who haven't been, been vetted, people who we don't know if they want to be Americans or they want to change America, and I think that's the biggest question that we have as we see more than one American coming in for every two births we have, which really, if these people are coming in and saying, we're going to change America to what we want, that's going to happen in a generation at these numbers. When you talk about the entire state of Ohio, I mean, this is a takeover if they want. It's a takeover. We're allowing people to come in having no idea what they want. And you're seeing the people of Chicago say, we don't like this. You're seeing the people of New York say, we don't like this. And the only reason... I think this is ironic. The only reason that we're getting to see them say, oh, wait, wait, not a fan, is because they said we want this. We want to be sanctuary cities. And Governor Abbott was like, OK, I'll give it to you. But now that they actually get it, the people that live there seeing their taxpayer dollars going to, to being taken away from their activities, from the things that they need it for, seeing it go to migrants, illegal aliens that are coming in and taking over and people who aren't even getting jobs, they're just getting money and housing. They're mad. Yeah. Don't you think that's those are the people that can be converted in this election? Yeah, I think it's moms and dads, particularly you think about the example in New York, moms and dads in New York, where the left uh, left the leaders in that uh, in that community said, your kids are going to have to stay home and learn remotely today because we're going to put migrants in your yeah. school, the school that your tax dollars pay for. I think a lot of parents, I think a lot of moms are going to say, what, what, wait a minute? You know, I learned a long time ago in politics that moms on a mission can get things done. And mm -hmm. uh, I think they're I think they're they're pretty ticked off about that. So you're right. The left, the leaders on the left, the crazy Democrat leaders 
you know, they're, they're a sanctuary t a city until it's actually time to provide sanctuary. No, 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 no. But, but then when they all come and say, well, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna put the burden on our taxpayers. We're going to let them have your school and your kids are going to have to learn remotely. I don't think people like that. And I think, again, that's going to help us uh, as, we, uh, as we go into this election. And there are a lot of people out there that are very hopeful that you will be able to do something quickly with Alejandro Mayorkas. Can you give us a little update on that well, and where, where that stands? Yeah, it's happening today as we speak. It's, uh, the, the, that's going on the Homeland Security Committee. Um, I, think, I think they'll, they'll have a long hearing today, a markup on the actual articles of two articles of impeachment against Mr. Mayorkas. I think that they'll prevail. Uh, the Republicans will. That'll, that'll come through the committee. And then I think we will go to the floor with a vote on that next week. Um, uh, you know, we'll see if their votes are there. I think they are. Um, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully get that, get that through uh, in, in the next two weeks. And then when that goes to the Senate, are you at all? I mean, we've seen some of these senators who have come out on the Democrat side and said, this is wrong. Will they stand and, and will they say, yes, we agree, we, we want to get rid of him? Or do you think that it's just going to be party lines? Uh, it's probably the latter. Uh, it's, it's unfortunately probably just party line. I saw John Fetterman on the roof with a, a flag, <laughs> an Israeli flag, and I'm like, can this guy yeah. actually say, okay, I agree with the border stuff or no? Is there a yeah. chance? Yeah, I, I, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, okay. But, you know, our job is to do oversight in the House. We're doing it on, on the border issue, a host of other issues. Um, that's, our, that's our constitutional duty. And then we look for legislative ways to remedy that. In some cases, when someone's, someone's in the executive branch is not, is, is their behavior is so egregious, so wrong, um, then you can, you can go to the impeachment issue. And we're looking at, we've got an impeachment inquiry right now into President Biden. We'll see if, if, the, if the facts dictate that we move to actual articles of impeachment when we complete that inquiry. Um, so that's just part of our constitutional responsibility. Well, I think it's important for people listening, regardless of what happens with impeaching President Biden, you get to vote him out. Do that. Make sure he is not back. Make sure that come November, you do not have to be embarrassed by a president of the United States that has no power and no strength, is not respected on the world stage, is being attacked. I mean, when I think about the fact that we've had over 100 attacks on our troops over in the Middle East, and we hear nothing. You've got, what was it, Blinken coming out and saying, well, this is the most dangerous situation we've ever seen. And yet we haven't really heard from the president about this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. Um, and who knows why? I mean, I have my 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 guess is why he hasn't said much. But, um, you know, again, I think it just underscores uh, the, the, the real difference between uh, President Trump and President Biden. And I think the country sees that. Um, and and, and we'll, that'll become even more clear, I think, as we move through this election cycle into November. I want to get to weaponization of government really quickly, because I think it was fascinating that this weekend we saw Saturday Night Live come out and say President Trump had a slight stumble in a speech when he was talking about debanking. They didn't even know the word existed. They had no idea that it's happened. We saw it happen in that. Canada. We've seen yeah. it happening to conservatives here. I actually love that they did it because I think people went, wait a minute, that's a real thing. You've been fighting against this, but I mean, it's deep. You've got financial institutions that are flagging if people buy something that has the word MAGA or Republican yeah. or anything. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing to protect us. Well, we're, we're just on the front end of this investigation. We've done a number of investigations on the censorship of speech and, and FBI whistleblowers coming forward and different things. But we're just on the front end of this. It started when we had an FBI whistleblower come tell us that around January 6, 2021, 20, uh, that there was an email between the government, uh, federal government and Bank of America saying, we want you, Bank of America, to give us all debit and credit card purchases on uh, in and around January 6. So a, a specific time frame at a specific mm -hmm. location here in the D.C. area. And we thought that was unusual. But then they also said, and we want you to overlay that with any, any purchase at any time of any firearm. And this is just, and so we had an agent who said he thought there was no predicate for this, for soliciting this type of information. It was done, we think, without any process. So no warrant, no legal process. Um, and this agent said this was inappropriate and didn't want to use this. So, but he brought it to our attention. So, and then from there, we've learned, as you pointed out, Tudor, that, that there are some of these online transactions you can put a message in with it. And they were asking banks to, to 
search their customers' database for certain key terms at the suggestion of the federal government, terms like MAGA, Patriot, Trump, those kind of things. And then also they were flagging just specific purchases at specific places. So if you shopped at Cabela's, which is half the people of Michigan and uh, the same in Ohio, I mean, you shop at that Bass Pro Shop or something, they were flagging those as well. So it's kind of creepy. We're just on the front end of this, uh, but we're going to continue to dig and see just how pervasive this actually was. Well, cr- I mean, creepy. I'm thinking about what we're seeing in China with social credit scores. And yep. we see the government saying, oh, we saw you did this and you did this. You're no longer welcome into these stores. You're no longer welcome to do this. We're going to take away your driver's license. I mean, this is when you see a government that is able to pick apart what you're buying. And for what? That's To me, that is the scary thing. Because once you have that information, if you have that someone went out and bought something that Trump apparel or something that said Trump or donated to Trump, or you went to Bass Pro Shops and bought a hunting rifle, and then you're suddenly on like a terror watch list because they were considering religious purchases, all of these things, suddenly you're an extremist. So, but this, but all of these things that make you an extremist are just people who are conservatives what was the plan do you are, that's what you're researching that's what you're investigating is what was the well, plan of what to do with this yeah no we're, we're no we're, we're we're just on the front of this investigation we know this is uh this is all part of this um this concept which remember joe biden gave the speech in pennsylvania uh with all the red lighting and look you know all the strange lighting and all and talked about uh called half the country fascist so they actually mm-hmm. there's this there's this mindset it seems that we've seen this with other investigations we've done where they weren't, they're trying to label everyone domestic violent extremist if they disagree with where, where the left is. So if you're, if you're exercising your First Amendment liberties and your Second Amendment rights, your Fourth Amendment, you're a domestic violent extremist if you're you know, conservative and you're buying a firearm. And, and that, is this, that, that is the scary thing. We saw this. The, the language we've seen in the documents thus far on this issue sounds an awful lot like the language we saw in the memorandum in the Richmond field office of the FBI where about a year and a half ago they said if you were a pro-life Catholic, you were an extremist. And it's the same kind of language we're we're seeing in a few of these handful of documents we just just started to get in this investigation, and that's the part that I think is so alarming. Hmm. Well, (laughs) we know that they love to go after the folks that are pro-life. We're seeing that that is their issue that they want to go after in 24. They want to make Trump into a guy that's going to take away choices for women and health care and all of that. But we are focused on the things that are hurting us every single day. You re- recently posted an article from last year about a fentanyl shipment to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Obviously, yeah. this is near and dear to my heart being in Michigan and near and dear to yours being in Ohio because this drug, it travels and it it, it just takes a tiny bit to kill someone. Yeah. This was linked to the Mexican drug cartel. We know that fentanyl is made in China. How much when you look at what Mayorkas has done with the border, letting these people across, the number of deaths of Americans that correlate to this issue at the border, why isn't that alone criminal for him? Yeah, it's really it's it's tragic, um, and it's and it's again I think been, been done deliberately because of the the deliberate policy decisions this administration made from going back to day one. And when you're spending all your time processing what, again, is going to be on pace to get to 12 million people in a four-year time period, when, when customs and border agents, when, they, when, they're, when everyone's focused on that, you're, you're allowing, by, by definition, it's the opportunity cost. When you're all focused on one thing, you can't do something else, and it's tougher to stop these drugs that are coming in, not via the ports of entry, but just coming in. Uh, they do catch some at the port, ports of entry. I get that, and God bless them for stopping that. But we know so much is getting in and the harm it's doing to to communities and more importantly, to families and individuals. Lastly, if we end up with a Trump administration, which I know we are all hoping that that is the case come November. Yeah. When that happens again, he has four more years. So this is a, a situation where he is going to get the last things done that he wants to get done. We wanted him to we wanted to see him clean up yeah. Washington. When you have that ability again. How much of this stuff that we saw with the Twitter files and all of that, that we we really started to see the corruption in government, how much of that is a Donald Trump administration able to immediately get into and say, we are fixing this right off the well, bat? Yeah, 
because we got legislation that that we're we we're going to introduce a bill here in a couple of weeks. A couple of my good good uh, colleagues on the Judiciary Committee, uh, we got legislative solutions to that. But you know, you can't get it through the Senate with Chuck Schumer. You can't get Joe Biden to sign it. So there there are things we can do legislatively if we can if we keep the House, gain the Senate, and and of course get President Trump in the White House. So it's it's important for policy reasons to protect. Your lib- I tell everyone all the time, we can recover from all the stupid things the Biden administration has done. We can recover, I think, from the bad border, the bad inflation policy, the bad energy policy, even the crime policy, foreign policy, if you get the President Trump back in there. But if they take away our First Amendment liberties, if they take away the fundamentals, that to me is so important. So we've got to continue to highlight what they're doing there, make this a part of the campaign. And then when President Trump's back in there, pass the legislation to further protect our constitutional liberties. I agree. So when you are out there looking at this race, it is multifaceted. You have to be out there voting for Donald Trump, but you also have to make sure that you are looking at what Senate races are in your state. I think a lot of people check out when they they think about a presidential. They're like, okay, that's the most important. You got to look at your Senate races. In Michigan, we have an open Senate seat. We've got open Senate seats across the country this year. You've got to make sure that you know who you're voting for for Senate. Same with your congressional uh representation. When you look at your congressman or woman, we in Michigan, we've had our lines redistricted. Some people who people thought are safe, they're not. If you have the ability, help them out. Give them money. Make sure you're donating to everybody out there because it takes a lot of money. The Democrats have endless money. That's what I found when I was running. Democrats have endless money. If you can donate, make sure you do it. Congressman Jim Jordan, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Good to be with you. Take care. Yes, and thank you all for joining us on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. For this episode and others, go to TudorDixonPodcast.com. You can subscribe right there or head over to the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts and join us next time on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. Have a blessed day.